tonight. We have about uh, 30 people, so I guess um, we can start and uh, probably more will join soon. Um, so everyone can see my screen, right? Oops, more people joining. Yep, okay. So, hi everyone, we're officially starting. Um, so, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm quite excited. We have uh, around 30 people already and hopefully a few more to come soon. And uh, I, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is uh, Stelios, full name is Stelianos Tabakis. You can find more about me from a website, thedatascientist.com. Uh, I identify with the title of a data scientist and I'm the admin of this group. Um, and my, you know, my, my work is in anything relating to AI and data science for the last 10 years or so. And I'm affiliated with University College London, with London Business School and a few other institutions as well. Uh, I'm, I have bo I'm both an academic, but also a practitioner. And um, I'm very excited about the space of AI and art. And it's also a, a space that I also participate in with some of my, some of my own uh, work. And uh, this meetup, um, I, I first became an administrator of this meetup around a year and a half ago um, when I first realized the potential of this space and how exciting this space is. And we organized our first event in 2019 in uh, Bethnal Green, which uh, was uh, sponsored by what, by, by what is now IX Machina in a very nice gallery around Bethnal Green. And uh, since then, the meetup has more than 200 uh, members. And uh, normally the, the meetup has to take place in galleries and this kind of spaces, but with COVID and everything happening, uh, I realized that, you know, it's gonna be a while until we see uh, a real like in-person meetup. So we thought we we're gonna run it virtually. And uh, I, I guess this was based on the turnout, it looks like this was a good idea. And that's a slide I included in my presentation on the first meetup where I was explaining, again, the motivations around this meetup and where I see the space going, etc. And uh, what I what explained back then, I'm going to explain now, is that uh, this space, over like a few years, we've seen some pretty amazing things happen. Obviously, it's not just AI and art. It's, in general, AI and especially deep learning. Uh, but it's been only a few years since the invention of, gen of dance generative adversarial networks. Uh, until we saw uh, an artwork being uh, sold in, in an auction house. And <clears throat> we're seeing more and more exhibitions, we're seeing more and more uh, events, uh, whether we're talking about um, events in art spaces or in, in academic conferences. And so it's clear that things are moving uh, very fast and it's probably only a matter of time uh, until this breaks into the mainstream, let's say in one way or another. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank, uh, before I move on and go to the logistics, uh, the immersive kind who have helped a lot to uh, make, to basically increase the turnover of this event uh, by sharing their, uh, by sharing a lot on social media and promoting this. So uh, thank you, Kadim, for that. And um, hopefully in the next event, we'll also be able to have some speakers from the immersive kind, which is an AI and art collective. And uh, yeah, moving on, uh, this is a schedule. Um, we're very lucky to have Gautier with us, uh, who, uh, is, uh, who is one of the co-founders of the Obus Collective, uh, which were the people that managed to, that basically they, they were the, among the first people to sell artworks at an auction and among the pioneers of the space. And I guess one of the good things about running a virtual meetup <laughs> is that uh, you can have people from all over the world. Uh, Gautier is based in Paris, so it's, it's, we're pretty likely to, to have him with us. And then Eva from the Serpentine Gallery. Uh, and then Pierre, who is going to talk about AI and music. Like many people think that the space of AI and art is only about generating images. So Pierre is going to talk about music, uh, I'd say, which is personally my favorite art form. So I'm really looking uh, to forward for this talk. And finally, Fabio, uh, who is an AI artist, is going to talk uh, about his work uh, and also about AI. 
Um, so a few things uh, about the logistics, uh, as you can all appreciate, I guess all of us have adapted to this new COVID reality. And as you can appreciate, Zoom brings some opportunities and challenges. Uh, the challenge is that uh, when there are many people uh, in a Zoom, sometimes some people forget to, to mute themselves and can be a bit noisy. Um, so I'm going to mute everyone during while, while someone is speaking. Um, we'll uh, let the, the, the participants, our speakers, uh, give a presentation for about 10 to 15 minutes each, and then there will be a five minute follow up and QA. If you have any questions, please type the questions into the chat room, and then I'm going to unmute you and you can interact directly with the speaker. This will help keep things uh, organized and, and avoid any confusion. At the end of all presentations, we're going to run uh, like a, a short, a quick panel, and we'll also let uh, anyone uh, to express their opinion so we can have a bit of a, um, let's say, more free flowing conversation. Uh, the intention there being that, on one hand, we want to facilitate discussion. It's, I mean, it's a very exciting space, and it's one of the reasons that we are organizing this event. Uh, and at the same time, we want to try and imitate to some extent, uh, you know, the same feeling as an in-person meetup. Obviously it's not the same, but you know, one of the key things behind the meetup is mingling, right? So we will we'll try to facilitate some, some virtual mingling for let's say 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so I will be the moderator for the duration of the meetup. And uh, yeah, that was it for me. And that being said, uh, I'm going to mute uh, all of you and I'll kindly ask uh, Gautier to uh, share his screen and start his presentation. Thank you. Yeah, all good. Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. So thank you everyone. Uh, it's really great to see uh, people from all around the world uh, joining this meetup. So thank you all for being here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, AI and creativity uh, from the artist point of view, uh, because I'm part of a collective called Obvious. Uh, so it's three of us. Uh, we're from France. We've started working in this field about um, three years ago. And uh, we started uh, by seeing uh, actually the discovery from uh, Ian Gutfellow uh, he had made in 2014. Um, and we, we saw that uh, in the research field because one of us is a, a researcher in uh, machine learning. And we thought uh, this kind of tool is like really impressive and uh, actually nobody knows about it or very few people in the world. So we wanted to kind of make this technology famous uh, and we thought the best way to do so uh, was to use art as a, as a medium. Uh, we did it because uh, we thought art was universal because it talked to everyone and everyone had kind of a relationship to, to it and could react to it uh, in their own way. So we started uh, by making the, the most obvious kind of art, uh, which was for us uh, 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 classical portraits. So we started with uh, creating a series of uh, classical portraits, um, about uh, 11 pieces. Um, and one of them has a kind of a crazy story because it was sold uh, at Christie's for like nearly half a million. Uh, and it, uh, it kind of uh, started uh, a movement with uh, people reacting to it as uh, the first piece uh, created uh, using this kind of technology to enter uh, uh, a large uh, auction house uh, and to be sold uh, in this type of, uh, of auction house. So basically it was kind of the art world opening to uh, this type of production. And uh, so for us, it was really crazy to be at the, the forefront of this. Uh, because we, we only had started uh, uh, about a year before to, to work with uh, those algorithms. The technology was still very young too. So the, the portrait is kind of blurry and uh, it's, not, uh, it's not what we can do uh, today with the, the new uh, models, but still uh, it's, it was a kind of a, a milestone. So we're really happy about that. And since, since then, uh, we've been continuing to work uh, with art. So first, uh, to keep reinterpreting different art movements. So we started with classical portraits, then we moved to Japanese prints uh, with a second series called uh, Electric Dreams of U Ukiyo. Um, and, uh, it's about like landscapes and uh, characters that we recreated using uh, artificial intelligence and generative adversarial networks specifically. 
uh, maybe a quick word about uh, generative adversarial networks. So those algorithms, uh, basically, uh, they manage to to um, see uh, using Im image recognition uh, a large number of examples, and if those examples uh, have similarities, they will detect it and they will manage to create new examples uh, using uh, a database. So you need, uh, for now, you need a, a large database to to perform this kind of thing. Uh, we used uh, about uh, 10,000 to 20,000 uh, images, uh, but the models are getting uh, better and better. And uh, uh, I don't doubt that in a few years you can you will be able to do it with uh, less images uh, and in uh, in about no time. Uh, right now it takes about a day of computation. Uh, then we move to uh, a third series about African masks uh, called the uh, facets of AGI. Um, and uh, we are about to release a full series uh, this Thursday uh, about uh, cave art. So we are kind of uh, making the, the widest gap between the first form of art and the, the latest uh, forms of technology. Uh, and we're crossing it with uh, street art. So you, you'll be able to see that uh, this week. But basically, the idea is to uh, use AI and also to talk about AI. So in our different series, uh, we always have a, a message uh, uh, behind uh, every piece, uh, which says that AI can be used in creative ways, um, that we tend to have uh, a wrong appreciation of what AI uh, actually is, uh, we, because of all the, the fantasies that uh, have been built uh, around AI. And when we work in that sector, we see that Basically, AI is just a tool uh, which has its own part of, uh, let's say, inventiveness, uh, but which doesn't have any intention. Uh, so it's really not going to replace artists, but it's more uh, a, a wonderful tool for us uh, because it allows uh, new artists to emerge, uh, which have like a different type of skills. So uh, in computing um, and maybe like other type of skills. Uh, for example, I, do, I don't know uh, how to paint at all, but uh, finally we, we managed to, to get here thanks to those algorithms. And also we think it can help uh, creatives that uh, work today with different tools such as uh, Photoshop or even some, some like uh, hand workers um, because it can be a, a source of inspiration for them um, and it can provide like a kind of an endless uh, uh, inspiration. So basically, we started using uh, generative adversarial networks. So those are the, the algorithms that we use the most. But uh, we have like many algorithms that we can use. Uh, you have algorithms to do a style transfer. So for example, uh, it looks like, uh, like filters uh, for, from Instagram. So you can take the style of a picture and put it inside another picture. Uh, you have tools for harmonizing pictures. So you take, uh, for example, an element, you put it in the picture, and it will uh, merge them and transform the elements so it fits with the whole picture. Uh, you have uh, algorithms that can learn uh, how to paint, kind of. So basically, you show them a picture, and it will show you like the different brushes uh, that it can use to recreate the picture. So you get a video uh, of, the, um, of the, the artwork being painted by the algorithm. Uh, you also have different tools that can um, you, you draw a sketch and then you get a realis realistic picture out of it. So, and you, you also have a deep face for videos. Maybe you heard about it. Uh, so it's about uh, replacing the face of someone uh, with another one and making say uh, different stuff. So with all that, that, those tools in hand, basically uh, you can do uh, different business applications, but you can also do art. And so that's what we, we decided to do. And it's really exciting because uh, it's about kind of making uh, uh, the bridge between what's being done in research, because of those algorithms, they don't uh, have the softwares uh, to be used and uh, the softwares are currently being built. So we're still working with uh, very raw uh, algorithms, uh, but still we're displaying them uh, to the world and we're displaying them uh, to creative people so that they, they can uh, start uh, learning how they work and when it gets out, uh, they know how to, how to use it. So it's a, it's a really interesting place uh, we're in because we are, we're kind of work, starting to work with um, businesses uh, and with creatives inside businesses. So we've worked uh, with Nike uh, to create a, a, new, a new sneakers based on uh, many examples of sneakers. 
uh, we're trying to approach uh, um, brands in fashion, uh, in architecture. Uh, we also uh, start working with food. So for example, you can take like many pictures of uh, dishes and you can uh, uh, create a new one to inspire a cook or stuff like that. So there are really uh, endless applications in uh, all of the, the industries that uh, uh, ask you to, to, to create basically. Uh, designers can also benefit from it. So there, there's really a lot of, of applications. Um, so I think um, what I can say uh, about that is that um, what I saw in the art world uh, and also in the in the kind of design world and in the business world uh, is that I think it can mainly go two ways. So one way would be uh, that really the, the, the AI technology is put forward because uh, people have an interest for that. Uh, we can see that people uh, want to know how it works, uh, are kind of fascinated by the way it works. Um, so there is really a subject to be discussed. Uh, also, like it has like many ethical Im implications and uh, like learning uh, uh, how it works through art is a good way to start asking yourself uh, questions about uh, how we should use it uh, as, a, as a society. Um, and the other way is, is that we see that uh, those type of algorithms is getting integrated into the tools that we use today. So for example, um, Photoshop is now, uh, has a, a different features uh, that, that are working with artificial intelligence without you knowing it. So uh, you can improve pictures uh, based on algorithms, but you don't really see uh, the difference between a classical feature and uh, a feature powered by uh, artificial intelligence. So in, in my opinion, I think uh, it can go like either one way or the other, either it's gonna be AI hidden uh, uh, and powering different features for creatives and all of this made into a, uh, a, nice, uh, a nice tool to, to, to design and to, to have like new inspirations. And another way would be to uh, kind of bring uh, the algorithms forward for what they are. And, uh, and we can, I think we can have a, an interest on that uh, for people to learn how, how they work uh, and to start uh, getting interested in, uh, in the research uh, being done in this field. So I don't know if I answered uh, any questions, <laughs> but uh, if you have some, uh, I'll be happy to do so. And uh, yeah, thank you for, uh, for your time. Uh, thank you, Gautier. Um, are, there, are there any questions uh, from, from the audience? I mean, what people are thinking about it, I, I have a question actually. Um, you know, my, my work is not only in data sciences, in, in algorithm development, even though I've done quite lots of this, but it's also on topics like data strategy and executive education. And I have been in many situations in a position where I felt that the, the people I was talking to from a business, they don't really understand the basics of data science. So they need to be educated before you can work with them. Um, have you seen something similar in your work with, with Obvious? Have you seen, for example, with Nike or with other uh, let's say companies or people you've worked with that um, maybe they have their own expectations around AI or they don't really understand what it can do and you, you felt that you had to spend time to educate them in a way. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, th there's definitely a part where we need to explain the algorithms, explain what they can do. Uh, and it, like the, fir the first reactions we have is that it's kind of frightening for uh, designers who think that they they can become obsolete and stuff like that. Uh, but I think what we need to, yeah, it's, it's stupid, but uh, I think what we need to put forward is that uh, it's, it can create in another way and it can create visuals that can only be created using that technology. So if we try to create um, visuals that can be created uh, in another way, uh, it might not be as interesting as if we show uh, some some visuals that are really uh, like that can only be created with this technology. So, for example, with GANs, you can generate pictures, but you can also generate videos, which looks like kind of more things uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, of um, like of different pictures. Uh, so, I think this is what we have to focus on, and we have to uh, when we when we talk to businesses and to to people who who might use uh, this in the future, we have to, to bring forward like the, the new features uh, that can be uh, created using AI and not uh, how to replicate the, the existing ones. 
But when you when you show that kind of visuals, uh, generally you get a, a nice uh, feedback, and uh, and so people are interested. Uh, like of course, right now is not the best uh, uh, time to to take risks for for businesses, but still uh, they they see the interest in it, and uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, they ask us to kind of develop a tool for their designers, or they ask us directly to create some uh, content for them, uh, we get some uh, some interest. So it's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I guess uh, what my, my, my assumption is that because what you guys are doing is very visual, uh, probably it's easier to also get the attention or explain it when you're talking to people who are not really coming from this space, uh, which probably makes it more easy compared to other parts of data science or AI, where if you talk about abstract algorithms, etc., people just don't, you know, they don't get it, they can't resonate with this. Yeah, kind of, but they also have, uh, they can also be uh, uh, kind of impressed by it more than uh, technical people, you know, because uh, this is uh, like, I don't know, two, two years ago, it was really hard to, to do that, but today it's uh, more and more accessible. So right now, I think that uh, people are, uh, people that don't know about this stuff, uh, when they see these kind of visuals, they are really impressed, Where, uh, whereas like people uh, who have been working in tech and AI for, uh, for the three last years, uh, they kind of have seen it all, and uh, they are uh, they're, they're more impressed about a, a really technical performance. Whereas here, it's just about uh, using existing algorithms and finding a nice idea of on how to on how to use them. You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Good point. All right. Um, if uh, uh, okay, it looks like someone has a question, Russell. Miller, uh, let me try to unmute Russell. Uh, ask to unmute. Maybe you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, you've been, you've been unmuted. Hmm. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I just had a bit of um, a question around being a complete sort of beginner with AI, having a bit of kind of coding knowledge and being a sort of visual artist and designer. Um, where do you start? Is it runway ML? Is that somewhere to start beginning to understand what it's like to kind of work with an algorithm to make a visual output? I've just got no idea. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, actually, I'm not the one doing the, the, the technical part uh, in the collective. Uh, so maybe uh, you can give me your email and I can send you like the, the best tutorials because uh, the guy I, I work with is actually uh, really good at uh, making you like jump the steps. Uh, so uh, I think if you if you give me your email, uh, I can send you like a list of tutorials that you can uh, that you can work with to learn quite fast. But uh, for him, it was more uh, learning about the um, the mathematical part because there is a, a kind of a mathematical knowledge to have uh, when you work with those algorithms. And once uh, you have this, uh, it's, you can really like do it uh, all by yourself. So uh, going on different uh, uh, types of website like uh, uh, GitHub or uh, Runway ML, uh, you can definitely find some uh, uh, some some tutorials and some algorithms to implement. Then start uh, working with them. Uh, but everything is uh, available online, you know. So you don't have to take uh, any course or any uh, any stuff like this. Uh, you can do it all by yourself. That's for sure. That's great. I'll, I'll I'll send you my email now. Thanks very much. Yep. Maybe you can send it to everyone. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like also, we can kind of collect resources. Sure thing. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are also part of the meetup um, group uh, because you can have conversations there. I shared the the link on in the chat room. So feel free to ask a question there, um, so that uh, you know maybe we can all contribute to it. Uh, okay, we have one more question, and I guess then we can move to, to Eva. You said, let me find Jeff. Uh, where is Jeff? Uh, unmute. Okay, Jeff has been unmuted. Good. Hello, everyone. I'm a researcher at, U at uh, UAL in London in AI and text generation mainly, but I've got a background in computer art. Um, I've got a question you mentioned earlier. Um, learning is a part of ethics. That's a really interesting statement that you think your educational side of the company uh, is going to improve society. Is that how you see it? That by spreading awareness, you increase uh, people's experience of what AI is, and so they're not frightened of it or looking at, you know, terminal yeah, exactly. movies and thinking it's all that. 
Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the idea. It's uh, about like promoting uh, an kind of an alternative use of AI, so a creative one. Uh -huh. And the idea is to to say that uh, the more people know uh, what algorithms are and what they can do and what they can't do, and uh, the more like the the debates around the ethical questions regarding AI will be productive. You know, because uh, if we have a debate uh, as a society around AI. Um, and about ethics around AI, and we don't know how it works, uh, basically it's gonna lead nowhere. So part of our job is to uh, kind of educate about how, uh, how it works, what it can do and what it can't. So that's quite inspiring for people that are doing art because is off, art is about a conversation. So if you have a conversation with a big company about art or design, then of course that's getting the maximum audience, isn't it? Yeah, kind of, uh, because yeah, you, you're right about that. Like uh, the big companies are actually the ones uh, deciding uh, today, um, but maybe it's also gonna come from the governments uh, because I think uh, the regulations uh, will have to come from them because uh, companies uh, basically they don't really care about the regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's, uh, it's a debate that has to involve everyone, uh, but the companies uh, already understand pretty well how algorithms work. Uh, and that's also why they they are like pushing it forward and they they're using it without uh, wondering about the the ethical questions. But it's more about uh, the people using the services and the products of the the companies. I think it's important to them to know what's behind it and uh, how it can raise um, ethical questions. Um, and so maybe they can like uh, have a, once they know once they have a better idea of. Uh, uh, what the algorithms uh, they use are, they can ask like more relevant questions and uh, ask like companies to make changes based on that, you know. Mm. Mm, very good. Great. Okay, great conversation. So yeah, th thanks, uh, thank you, Gauthier. Uh, and thanks also the our participants who raised some interesting questions. And uh, now uh, I guess um, uh, we should move on and uh, kindly ask uh, Eva to, uh, you mentioned Eva that you would like to share some of the work that has been happening at uh, Serpentine, I think. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself and you just go ahead. Hi everyone, um, thanks very much for having me. Um, I am an artist and also associate curator at the Serpentine. I, um, in my own practice, I also work with machine learning, um, not only uh, technically, but also conceptually. And um, it was in 2018 when I was doing the, when I was a designer in residence together with my creative partner that we started really uh, digging into machine learning and the whole kind of construct of AI. And this naturally bled into my work in the arts technologies department um, at Serpentine. So, I thought what might be most interesting or helpful for this conversation is to kind of tell you a little bit about how the lab positions itself, because really it, it is supposed to be a resource for people like all of you who are interested in the subject, maybe new to um, making with ML. Um, so the Creative AI Lab is um, not just the Serpentine, it's, it's also um, the Digital Humanities Department at King's College. And it was important for us to kind of expand the conversation into the digital humanities and especially to the principal investigator, Mercedes Bunce, who I work really closely with um, because of her philosophy of kind of digging into the technical um, and really seeing that we can't necessarily separate the technical object and therefore we need to be in conversation with computer scientists and people who are working in the back end of these technologies. So that was kind of the, the framing conversation for the lab. I'm the co-I of, of the lab and together we sort of come up with ways to provide not only to conduct research, but also because of my role at the Serpentine to bring an audience in and, and let them in on the research as it's happening. So the lab follows the premise that um, currently we're in the very early stages of understanding aesthetics and also the semiotics of artificial intelligence. And it's something that we haven't necessarily created that much cultural or civic space for. Um, we also approach AI as a framework that holds together a number of disciplines, technologies and systems. So um, be that creative, cultural or computational. Um, so historically the themes that are 
contained within the current AI discourse, um, such as automation, intelligence, um, alien logics, biases, interfaces, etc. They've featured as cornerstones of various um, hyped technologies, including uh, robotics, virtual reality, machine learning. And, and so we kind of openly admit that today AI is uh, the wrapper via which we're engaging in these kind of fundamental concepts of digital culture. And those are necessarily intertwined with artistic practices. Um, so the Serpentine between 2016 and 2020 commissioned and oversaw and has, and has been overseeing the production of a number of AI um, technologies, a, a number of projects that use AI technologies, um, both as a technical medium, but also kind of conceptual reference or narrative cue. So um, this is a sort of gambit of artists from uh, someone like Ian Chang, who's really working with the technology itself um, through simulation and game design, to um, an artist like Suzanne Treister, who is a kind of mapping the history of cybernetics um, and is actually a painter. She did used to make video games, but she's now primarily a painter. So uh, the lab, um, which formed in 2019 and kind of officially launched um, this year in July, necessarily grew out of this need to explore and um, experiment with the kind of process that happens in the production phase of creating these artworks. Typically, it's very condensed. And although we're very involved, we, um, we're in a delivery mode. And so we don't really have time to sort of digest and think about ways to disseminate the information that we're learning, or in, in many cases, the new technology that we're developing with our production teams. Um, and so we saw an opportunity for kind of writing research papers, conducting research, and, and, and bringing an audience into that research space. Um, by focusing on the production of these sort of like back end environments of this kind of art making, we've been able to investigate really interesting ways that artists are remaking interfaces, um, building data sets, and generally kind of breaching into the black or gray box of AI technologies. Um, it's especially interesting to us, this idea of, of the interface. It's something that is kind of the origin story of the lab. So Mercedes was researching um, kind of where are the new AI interfaces being created in, in this case for her research around uh, data and health. And we were chatting and I was sort of telling her that in the production process of making a lot of these artworks, custom interfaces were being designed. And I was sort of showing her some of this proprietary um, information and she was like, oh, th this is happening. This thing I'm searching for, these like new and novel um, or like somehow perverted or um, different ways of designing an interface for various kinds of users is happening in this sort of hidden space of artistic production. And it very rarely makes it sort of into the exhibition space or even as a kind of artifact of the project. Um, except some artists like Rafik and Adol, they really show their, the interfaces that they're making. Um, it's also important to just mention that um, doing this kind of R&D research and focusing on the back end means that um, it was important for me to insist on a kind of um, mandate that we wouldn't be asked to show or make um, front end artworks and this sort of is more about more political and art making but that the pro the process um, of engaging with the technology would really be seen as the core of the work um, so in that way the lab can hold space for conversations and research and kind of hands-on experimentation um, that addresses the technical framework of ai and their impacts on art making, but also conversely, the possible impacts of art making that deploy AI on AI research and development. So we wanna kind of test that. Um, 
there's a couple reasons to insist on this exploratory kind of creative R&D format within the art institutional setting. Um, I think, firstly, constructing an organization within an organization, um, we can, like I said, be unbound from those front end formats. Um, and instead, we can follow someone like um, one of Mercedes great references, Simon Duan, who was working in the humanities, but sort of famously had this lab where he was taking devices apart and working in a very experimental way. Um, the second part, which is slightly controversial, <laughs> is that we want to provide a kind of necessary supplement to the generic approach to AI that our institutions, um, our institutional discourse has um, been able to offer uh, when just interpreting front end artworks that use AI technologies. So to this extent, our, our mission is to develop a kind of critical literacy um, like you were mentioning, you know, a kind of upskilling the client. We're also trying to figure out how to um, upskill or, or create language, which is both accessible, but also precise. You know, we were noticing that it, it was very often in the art world that we kind of separate ourselves from the technical by always talking about kind of machine hallucination or a kind of um, shamanic mysticism, which can be embedded into the work, but should be done very carefully. And um, yeah, just a more of a focus on precision. If we, um, we, we held a, a talk recently with Nora Khan and she was sort of saying, if we constantly re re refer to this kind of like GAN imagery as machine dreams, you know, we're never really going to take the time to understand um, what it would really mean for a machine to dream and what we mean by that language. So it's just sort of taking a pause and, and opening that up a little bit more to develop a more sophisticated kind of poetics of, of AI. Um, and that's also a generational shift, you know, the, the kind of curatorial capacity um, to be able to engage with these projects is going to shift um, and curators, I think, will necessarily become more trained as you know, have skills in programming or um, sort of be able to pick up the, these kinds of um, ways of practicing, experimenting, um, and not just be trained in, in art history. Not to say that all curators aren't, no shade, sorry. Um, what else do I want to say? Yeah, so, um, we want to kind of pause and reevaluate the narratives that we're producing and be careful to not always sort of rep reproduce a narrative where art is the antidote to technology. So that, that idea of like kind of the critic on a pedestal looking at the technic, but instead to say that the tech sort of that the technology and the artist are intertwined and actually the artist is a very valuable part of its development also thinking through the ethics of it, et cetera. Um, so we believe that cultural producers of all kinds should be involved in forming the cultural meaning of AI technologies. And um, like I said before, since we can't separate the cultural meaning of a technology from the technical object itself, for instance, the machine learning system, we kind of need to go through the technology, through the back end, and make space for that work, which is what the lab does. So um, we've We've started um, by forming this database, which is basically a way to consolidate a different kind of narrative of knowledge around AI. And I will put it in the chat and I can also put it in the meetup resources list. Um, essentially, it came from this kind of insight that many people are in intimidated to just jump into GitHub and kind of like get a re go through a repo, like just set it up. Um, and instead they need a little step in between. And also another insight, which was basically that when people start Googling or looking up tutorials on this uh, technology, that they very quickly go into a kind of um, technical wormhole um, that doesn't necessarily easily connect to really interesting um, uh, theory on the subject. Um, 
or artistic work, and actually that these things should really commingle. So the database is separated into resources and tools, and you can search by keywords, you can search by author, you can search by the kind of um, uh, work that you do, so like text, moving image. Um, and we've populated it with resources from people who we've worked with and done interviews, held panel discussions with. And we have also are going to be engaging in a series of commissions, the first of which was with uh, Luba, Luba Elliott, who's a curator in research specializing in artificial intelligence. And she was really key to kind of doing a first landscape of um, a kind of current creative AI ML tools. And um, there's about 65 tools right now and several tutorials and free courses, um, which you can find alongside lots of interesting theory and podcasts and essays and so on by artists, thinkers. Um, so yeah, my aim was to sort of create these pathways um, to thinking about AI and learning about it from a kind of artistic uh, standpoint. So you can stumble on Natalia Fuchs's AI manifesto, um, or um, you can find the indigenous protocol for working with AI by indigenous protocol and AI working group in Hawaii. And you can also learn about runway ML. Um, we are convening a number of panel discussions, the first of which has already taken place on the aesthetics of AI with really great thinkers on the subject like uh, Nora Khan, Joanna Zelinska, and Morat Khan. And uh, we create associated readers and those are all available online for free. Um, and we're also supporting, you know, I said it should be an experimental place. So we're doing an investigation into our, one of our own archives and natural language processing. And we're also supporting um, artistic process, uh, artistic projects in their kind of research phase. And we're currently working with Orphan Drift and Etic Lab on a sort of multi-year program looking at octopus intelligence and training AI to interact with non-human subjects like the common octopus. And there's an image of one of um, Maggie Roberts octopus meditations behind me. Um, I think that's all I'm gonna say. I'm sure I spoke too long. Great, thank you. Um, um, I'm wondering whether it might be a good idea to maybe uh, share some uh, in, the, in the chat room, some of the links around the the yes, things you mentioned, like your work. Uh, I think this would be this would be very helpful. It looks like everyone likes the idea of a Google Doc. <laughs> so yes. I'd say maybe we can uh, maybe anyone who's interested, um, because it will be difficult to coordinate everyone over email. Uh, maybe you can simply post on the Meetup page because it offers some kind of functionality like like a forum. Um, again, here I'm going to create a comment now. Okay. So yeah, did you? Um, oh, I'm sending. I'm sorry, I thought I was writing in the chat, but I'm actually just sending direct messages. <laughs> no worries. <sighs> okay, so here's. So, yeah, I, I also tried to share a link with everyone. I accidentally shared it with some of our participants. Sorry, this happens with Zoom. Okay, perfect. Uh, and there's a question from Tracy who is asking, how does your work link in the computer art society work? Uh, let me unmute here, Tracy. Hi. Um, Hi. Hang on, let me put a bit on. There you go. Hi, really great talk. Thank you very much. Really interested in what you have to say on this. Um, I work with Luba as well. I run the Art AI Festival, which is actually... Okay. Um, a front end thing so I'm more about engaging with the general public mm -hmm. but I'm really interested to know how you align your 
contemporary views on this with the work of the um, organizations like the Computer Arts Society? Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that's very important is that I'm not proposing anything drastically new. I, um, I don't think that the research that we're doing is like novel or something. I'm not trying to claim any space, but I think the place that we're, that the research is taking, that we're doing this research in and kind of carving space in is the thing that has sort of changed. I mean, the Serpentine is traditionally, um, you know, seen as this gallery space, which maybe for too long ignored the computer arts or like invited those kinds of thinkers during symposia or whatever, but wasn't sort of integrated into the programming in the same way. And we've, you know, with the arts technologies program, we are trying to sort of like carve away at those um, more traditional divides between contemporary art, computer arts and, and those kinds of subjects. Does that answer? The question a bit. Well, it, it, it begins to, it's a difficult area, isn't it? Because there seems to me to be two very different communities that yeah. are operating in this domain. And, you know, I work a lot with the, the nine, you know, the, the original set from the 1960s. Yeah. Who, you know, like Ernest Edmonds, one of my colleagues, and uh, Harold Cohen and all those kinds of guys who would argue that they've been creating this work for donkey's years. Absolutely, and, yeah. Um, you know, have been, but primarily, I think, I think you're right. You hit the nail on the head when you said that. You know, a lot of the discourse is about uh, has been about justifying the aesthetic, not how the technology and the aesthetic work together. And I think that's a really interesting um, positioning that you're making there. So thank you. Yeah, I think that some of, you know, we work really closely with Rebecca Allen, for instance, someone who's just so brilliant and in the contemporary art world has been very underrepresented. So I think we are very aware that we, um, we don't want to, yeah, like forge ahead and pretend like this is new. We want to sort of like pay respect to a lot of the people you mentioned and yeah, be tread carefully, I guess. Great. Um, any other questions? How is NLP being used in this space? Oh, a bit of a broad topic, uh, but I'm going to unmute you. And yeah, maybe you want to ask this question directly to Eva. Oh, wait. Ask to unmute. Uh, you're mute. All right, sorry. <laughs> Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, I was wondering how is NLP being used in this space? Uh, like automatic poetry writing or trying to like that kind of, what are the kind of things that are going on? Oh my God, I can't hear anything. Have I your mute as well? Wait, let me ask to unmute, okay. Big brother has unmuted me. Okay, so um, natural language also, yes. So essentially, I just really wanted to dig into this technology. And um, one of the things that I have access to through the Serpentine, um, it, through our very kind artistic director, Hans Ulrich Obrist, is access to his huge history of um, interviews. And these date back to like 1994 and they're in various forms, video, audio, um, scanned PDFs, notes, et cetera. But they all um, sort of follow the same form, which is basically him as the interviewer with the interviewee. So you have these really clean kind of conversational turns that are um, easy is not the right word to say, but um, would be very straightforward to train uh, a model on. And um, so I'm now in the process of working with the archives to kind of um, clean all of the data. And we're working with the poet and, and programmer Alison Parrish in NYU uh, to sort of think through how do you take the system of knowledge and language like someone like Hans Ulrich Obrist and the kind of vast connections that you can draw between all different kinds of thinkers 
and turn that into a kind of um, yeah, system that you can interact with. I don't want to say chatbot because it will, uh, it's very unlikely that it will result in, in, in something like a chatbot, but thinking about the interface as, as a kind of um, window into the archive and a way to understand the archive better. But I guess what's important to me is that we have to do it ourselves. So we don't commission someone to do it, but instead like I'm really learning what it means to create a, a, a database and um, we're working with um, Allison on a couple different ways. So semantic similarity is sort of like one um, route we're going down. We're also working with GPT uh, two and three, you know, fine tuning um, these models based on the data sets. We're also working with something called Raza just to experiment with like what would happen if we um, kind of tr sort of use the data set plus sort of trained it knowing what people will ask. Um, we are also working, not AI, but we're working with um, something called context analysis with some re researchers at Aberdeen University to try and see like if we can understand more from what's generated in these sentences than um, the sort of like not NLP would be able to. So we're just trying lots of things. And in a typical production scenario uh, where we would commission an artist, have a very specific budget and have a you know exhibition moment, we wouldn't necessarily build in the time or resources to test so many different things. Thanks. Uh, I think, yeah, GPT-2 and GPT-3 are the way to go if you're interested in natural language generation. Um, there's one more question, but I, I guess maybe we can discuss about the natural language processing at the end of the session of the panel, because I don't want us to run um, out of time. And that being said, uh, Pierre, uh, the stage is yours. Feel free to share your screen. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to talk to you about AI and music tonight. Um, can you guys see my screen? I, I assume so. So I'll, um, great, yeah, I'll, I'll jump um, right in, but maybe just before I start talking about uh, AI and music, just a little bit of background uh, about myself. Um, so my own background is I'm a cellist and I'm also a qualified actuary. I've spent the past decade developing uh, data science teams and building AI related uh, products and services. And about two years ago, I started doing a part-time master's at uh, Cambridge University. And as part of my degree, I developed a sound piece. And now, uh, but about sound piece, it's a music technology startup and we develop AI driven products that help uh, um, people create and share uh, beautiful music. And um, now, Specifically, when I say to people I'm uh, working on AI and music, uh, given that AI is such an incredible buzzword, people have slightly different uh, uh, concept of what that means. So I think generally uh, uh, what society thinks I do is, is this type of um, uh, um, idea. Um, what my friends uh, think I do is uh, a slightly different, uh, um, different idea. And then what I actually end up doing is uh, uh, much more uh, focused on uh, writing specific code uh, and training algorithms. Now, specifically also just AI in general, um, I think given that it's such a buzzword, uh, what is it actually? And I think that we can spend the whole uh, um, uh, evening just talking about trying to define it. But the, for me personally, it's really, um, um, I see it just as software that exhibits some behavior that appears to be intelligent. And that the idea itself can be traced back to probably the 1950s and uh, an Alan Turing's paper uh, uh, around computing machinery and intelligence. And the recently, uh, really what's making um, headways in the news is a specific sub uh, field and a subset of techniques and, uh, and uh, called machine learning and specifically deep learning that's really uh, made a significant breakthrough uh, and that's uh, uh, had some really um, exciting uh, applications. Now, specifically in the music industry, if you um, look at the relationship between music and maths and algorithms, there's actually quite a long history. I think it, probably you can trace it back to about 500 BC, where I think Pythagoras uh, realized that um, look, music and mathematics uh, uh, weren't uh, or shouldn't, in his view, uh, have been separated studies. So, uh, they, they 
really uh, um, uh, connected. Um, and when you go to move on uh, to sort of the Middle Ages and the idea and, and rules behind music, music creation um, started being documented. And, and we moved to sort of the 18th um, century, there's the first type of uh, uh, music compositions that's, uh, that's based on some form of stochastic process. So for example, uh, Mozart's Dice Game uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, is basically um, designed where you throw a dice and wherever the dice lands, that gives you a specific note uh, and, uh, and music to play. And you end up with uh, and, uh, really a lot of different combinations of playing a specific waltz as part of this game. And if we move towards the 20th century, Schoenberg, uh, for example, developed the 12th tone technique, which is again using a set of algorithms and rules to create music compositions. The 1950s, Cage uh, and, and developed aleatoric music, which is uh, chant music where a specific uh, composition might have a set of rules, but there's also a lot of chants uh, and, uh, that de uh, determines how the, the song itself uh, um, develops. Um, and then uh, in the 1960s, Hiller and Isaacson um, started uh, creating the first sort of uh, computer assisted um, algorithmic uh, composition. So there's quite, quite a long history already with algorithms and music. And if we fast forward to today, um, AI is already playing quite a, quite a big role uh, across the music industry. And again, for me personally, just to make sense of it, um, but, uh, I can sort of think of two broad categories where AI uh, features. And on the one hand, it's around uh, um, helping uh, uh, um, create music. And on the other hand, it's uh, facilitating uh, the consumption of music. And so in terms of the um, creation of music, uh, there's a number of applications where AI helps uh, music producers uh, mix uh, and, and create new, uh, uh, new songs and also to help with the education around uh, music uh, and uh, creation. And on the music consumption side, um, there's quite a few different AI applications that helps uh, facilitate music discovery and uh, helps uh, artists and helps uh, also um, sort of adapt music for health and relaxation uh, type, of, uh, type of applications. And, and specifically, uh, uh, um, sort of on the music discovery and listening side, there's a lot of AI being used to help uh, tag uh, big databases of, uh, of audio files and makes, the, uh, makes that available. So for example, Spotify in the background has got some uh, quite sophisticated algorithms to try and recommend to what type of music uh, you would listen to based on previous uh, music that you've uh, uh, liked. On the artist support side, there's quite sophisticated algorithms um, uh, that helps identify um, on what type of uh, um, uh, places would be a good uh, um, area um, uh, to do a specific concert based on segmentation and analysis on, on your uh, um, listeners. Uh, there's also quite interesting applications to try and uh, identify up and coming um, artists to invest in uh, uh, for music uh, uh, labels. Um, on the health and realization side, uh, there's a lot of applications that adapts music, uh, for example, in gaming, uh, and rather than having the repetitiveness of the same music, uh, playing over and over and changing music as you, as you change uh, um, your experience in the game and as the game involved. Um, and then also there's a number of applications of, uh, um, on social platforms and music sharing platforms where AI um, is playing a role. Um, on the music production side, there's quite a few applications uh, around mixing uh, music together uh, uh, and finding uh, um, uh, um, ways in which uh, um, artists are helped uh, uh, to streamline and improve that uh, um, uh, process. And then on the music education side as well, um, having recommendations and personalized uh, um, uh, lessons uh, um, uh, to help uh, um, users navigate through uh, um, uh, the whole process of uh, learning either an instrument or, or, or uh, um, how, to, how to create music. Now, all of these applications and all of these um, um, areas, uh, the reason why it's uh, made possible is uh, because of uh, data. And uh, I think like in most uh, applications, data is the fuel for the, uh, for the algorithms. And there's been just this significant exponential growth in uh, the amount of data um, available that makes all of these applications uh, work. And, and in terms of the actual algorithms that get uh, used in all of these um, uh, applications, it's quite similar to, uh, to other industries as well. And um, very broadly, it's always categorized in sort of three, three broad categories. On the one hand, um, sort of unsupervised learning where um, algorithms help uh, um, uh, um, identify sort of uh, without having a specific uh, clear outcome that is trying to predict, but trying to pick up relationships in the data and group uh, and uh, uh, common data together. So for example, a lot of clustering uh, te techniques gets used in a number of different applications and it, specifically in the music industry. 
And uh, clustering helps uh, on audiophiles, group similar type of audiophiles together, which then makes it possible to provide uh, quite interesting music uh, recommendations for users. On the supervised learning side, uh, where it's algorithms trying to predict a specific clear outcome that you're telling, um, it to predict um, application of the music industry, for example, in mixing, is trying to identify uh, when there's a specific beat in music and, and trying to predict specific rhythms that helps facilitate uh, and, uh, remixing and mixing of, um, of music. And then on the reinforcement learning side, um, that's where there isn't necessarily a specific outcome that uh, uh, the algorithms try and predict, but there's a set of rules and a set of uh, um, uh, 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 principles and based on those specific rules, if an agent uh, um, chooses a specific um, action, that action gets a specific reward. And again, for music composition, uh, there's a number of interesting applications uh, um, where reinforcement learning can be used, uh, where you have specific rewards that you give based on a combination of notes or combination of uh, chords that sound uh, uh, good together, and you give a specific reward uh, for that. So. Uh, these applications have, uh, um, or these type of algorithms have applications across multiple industries and uh, specifically the music industry as well. Now, uh, what's probably the most interesting um, for uh, 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 people interested in art uh, and music is music creation and uh, music generation. And there's a number of different approaches and interesting algorithms uh, that facilitate music creation. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about some of, uh, some of these ideas. So I think one um, field is called translation models, and, and that's uh, quite applicable for um, uh, for artists, where it's taking a specific uh, um, uh, picture and converting that to sound based on some form of uh, rules and relationships. So for example, based on certain colors or certain uh, um, uh, um, uh, patterns in the uh, um, uh, picture, converting that into uh, into music has been quite an interesting application. And um, I think uh, a second sort of more uh, sophisticated approach is uh, where stochastic models that get used and specifically Markov change. And uh, without going into sort of detail there behind it, it's basically uh, uh, where um, the sequencing of notes or the sequencing of a specific song depends on um, uh, a certain likelihood. So depending on, for example, if you use the one set of chords, um, there's a likelihood that a following chord uh, progression uh, 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 would be followed. Um, and as as you have uh, multiple uh, chords, again, the probabilities change and you sort of, in this transitional matrix, uh, you select different notes and different chords uh, and, and you combine them together to form um, uh, um, a composition. Um, and another approach is where it's a little bit less uh, just based on randomness and stochastic processes where there's um, uh, a little bit more formal rules which are built in. So for example, there's certain standard chord progressions that uh, uh, most of pop music uh, for example, uh, and, and use. There's also a number of rules around what type of uh, combination of notes work well, uh, how you move between different keys and how you uh, move between the and, uh, and different uh, melodic lines. And by coding that in, um, and again, adding that, combining that with a stochastic process where there's some randomness combined with the rule set uh, and system uh, and ends up producing quite, uh, 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 quite interesting uh, uh, music compositions. Um, I think uh, coming towards more sort of state of the art type of AI and, uh, and systems, uh, uh, one approach is where it's uh, more of an optimization type of problem to solve. And as I mentioned earlier, with reinforcement learning, um, a number of interesting compositions can be um, uh, created where, um, again, there's an environment uh, that's uh, set and that environment that you set up as your rule system where you uh, personally set up well the following chord progressions or the following combination of notes uh, are more preferable to others. Uh, all of those get a specific uh, reward and then the algorithm itself learns to optimize uh, the combinations that actually ends up giving a high score and then also ends up with um, interesting um, music composition. And then lastly, I think uh, similar to what was uh, discussed earlier in a couple of the applications, uh, neural networks um, and systems that learn from underlying data, uh, especially in recent years, have uh, made some significant breakthroughs in uh, music uh, and uh, creation. Now, um, these are sort of uh, at a high level, a few different techniques and a few different strategies of where um, algorithms and AI uh, get used uh, and, uh, to create and generate new music. And um, uh, I think quite an interesting concept is uh, to what extent there's a relationship between um, AI and uh, a human uh, as part of the creative process and, and uh, creating 
and music. Now, uh, I saw this diagram, uh, which uh, the, the, for me personally, I, uh, uh, um, explains it quite uh, uh, quite well. Where the sort of on the horizontal um, axis, on the one hand, uh, on the left hand side, you've got uh, sort of uh, applications and areas where optimization is really important, and on the right hand side, it's applications and areas where creativity and strategy um, is much more important. And then on the vertical axis, uh, um, at the top, it's where uh, there's applications where a lot of compassion is needed, and at the bottom is uh, applications where you don't really need uh, that much uh, compassion. So, for example, at the bottom left, uh, 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 those are applications where you don't need a lot of compassion and, uh, and there's a lot of scope for optimization. And it's often areas where there's a lot of repetition and applications, for example, of uh, trying to automate uh, the washing of your dishes or uh, trying to automate the flipping of a, uh, a burger patty. And, and uh, McDonald's says not a lot of compassion that you need. There's a lot of uh, repetition. And I think those are areas where you can really uh, fully automate um, and uh, um, just have an AI system run those type of uh, applications. I think if you move up uh, at the top left uh, and side uh, where it's a bit of compassion needed, but there's also a bit of repetition in areas where um, optimization is possible. Applications that's uh, quite relevant there is probably more education-based uh, applications. So for example, where it's the same type of thing that you want to teach people uh, and uh, the content itself might stay uh, quite similar, but uh, you also need uh, a bit of compassion and a bit of tailoring of the way in which you uh, and, uh, teach a specific uh, and a person. So this combination of having AI at the core, uh, but then having a human around it, uh, um, I think leads to really good uh, and uh, good results. And um, moving to sort of the right hand side uh, and, and at the bottom right, that's applications where um, sort of you don't need a lot of uh, um, uh, compassion, but actually strategy and creativity is, is quite important. I think applications like um, for example, science and scientific research is probably a good example for that space where on the one hand you have to, it's new groundbreaking work and uh, that's being done. So there's definitely creativity needed for it. But a lot of the decision making is quite core cool based on data and facts. And again, they, AI can play quite a, quite a big role and you have also a human that helps with the strategy and the combination leads to quite, quite good results. And then the top uh, right hand side um, is areas where you need a lot of compassion and a lot of creativity as well. And I think for me, again, uh, personally, um, this is probably the area where music uh, uh, falls. And I think the role that AI uh, will play, at least in the, in the, in the short term in this space, I think is this combination of using AI together with a human. So on the one hand, uh, um, AI can learn from uh, um, uh, previous music uh, um, uh, rules. It can help uh, generate ideas, but there's definitely this combination of having a human uh, in, in the loop and working with the AI I think leads to much, much better, uh, um, better and more interesting uh, and music and more interesting um, um, art. And, um, and it's this type of approach as well that I've, uh, uh, we've sort of taken at, uh, um, at Soundpiece and the work that we've done. Is, and the idea uh, is that really with the training neural networks uh, on, on music, um, you get the ability to generate lots of different and interesting ideas. So within seconds, you can create uh, hundreds of different songs. But it's still uh, um, uh, important that there's a human in the loop actually selecting which parts and which ingredients, and which components of those songs that were created uh, fits well together. And combining them in together um, ultimately leads uh, to generating much more interesting uh, and, uh, and higher quality music. Rather than trying to automate the full process and removing uh, the human completely from the process, um, building AI in a way where it augments uh, the creation of music um, I think personally uh, and leads to much, much more interesting uh, um, uh, results. And this is where really the approach that we followed, we've sort of developed a, um, a, a, what do you call an Inspire plugin, uh, which is uh, um, a way of uh, productionizing the neural networks that we've uh, built, uh, but it's uh, music producers can use it as part of the normal workflow in the same music uh, production software that they currently use. Um, it uh, um, plugs in directly uh, with that software and helps them generate new ideas and, uh, and uh, a new part of a, uh, of a song that they then incorporate into uh, um, a longer and a bigger uh, a musical work. Um, and uh, I can maybe just very quickly play a couple of examples of uh, music uh, created by AI. Uh, let me know if you can't hear um, it. The idea is you know, that you can create in a lot of different styles. So this is much more orchestral. You can have a little bit more of a pop type of uh, um, song feel. 
Um, we're going to have something that's a little bit more um, classical and piano based. Um, or a little bit more of uh, um, a trap type uh, a modern song. Um, rock type uh, um, a field. Or a little bit more cinematic and uh, 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 the epic type uh, of sound. So, it's just a brief uh, couple of examples of the type of music uh, created by um, AI. And if you want to uh, listen to more examples, so actually uh, give it a try, uh, please go to um, our website and um, yeah, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would love yeah, to take any questions that, uh, that you might have. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, that's very, very uh, interesting. But actually, want to <laughs> to use this myself. You know, I like to, to write music as a hobby. Uh, so I might uh, actually ping you after the the meetup. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Are there any questions from our audience? What about AI music performance by people? Let me ask to unmute. Hey. Hey. Hi. Hey, hey, see you. <laughs> ah, how are you doing? You okay? Yeah, all good. Good, good, good. Um, no, I just had a, a quick question. I mean, um, I used to work in the music industry for for some years actually, um, and it was across in in um, production, writing to licensing, A and R, um, and one and, and publishing. And one of the things that that I know is a big pain right now is in live performances. Is there any or are there any solutions that you've thought of that could help uh, musicians in in live performances? Because of course now that that revenue stream for them has really gone downhill. Um, of course, creating music is is really great, and a lot of people are still creating. Uh, but from a point of actually getting the music out there, is there anything that you've thought of or anything that you've tested to implement AI with? Yeah, I th um, I'll talk about a couple of examples on uh, live music. I think one area that's quite interesting and. Uh, what have changed, for example, with uh, COVID, where people can't uh, obviously have rock concerts in, in person. Uh, I think streaming and uh, doing um, uh, collaborating and playing music to, together in um, real time is qu quite a difficult uh, um, concept. So especially if you're in different locations because of the latency and there's a little bit of a, a lag, even while we're speaking now, there's a little bit of a lag, especially if you're trying then to perform and play music together, that becomes impossible. Uh, and I think a lot of the uh, and the value that you get when you perform with other musicians is that you're know, being in the same place, you're being able to react uh, within uh, really many, many seconds. Um, and I think there's a couple of interesting applications in where AI is trying to help with that lower um, latency. So for example, I think also why video calls um, have um, improved quite dramatically and, uh, and over time is that not all of the data that we're seeing is constantly being trans uh, transmitted. There, there's sort of uh, predictions being made of exactly what pixel moved and, and a smaller so uh, a subset of the data gets transformed to speed up the process and make it a much smoother area. And I think similarly, there's a few companies doing interesting work to try and make uh, uh, reduce the latency and, and enable people to uh, uh, play music together uh, um, uh, um, virtually um, at sort of uh, very, very low levels of uh, latency. So I think that's, that's one area where there's been a number of um, uh, interesting uh, um, applications where the AI uses image recognition type of algorithms uh, to try and uh, improve that. Um, oh, another yes. area which is not, so not necessarily uh, applicable for uh, solving uh, COVID related um, issues, but I think there's a number of interesting AI applications where um, it's uh, taking an algorithm, it's taking sort of what a musician is, is doing or, or starting point of a composition and then creates new variations of it uh, um, and doing that quickly enough that it's in real time so that, that you almost get to a place where there's music performers that uh, interact with uh, uh, an AI agent uh, and creating music in real time. And I think this is quite interesting sort of creatively speaking uh, applications happening in that space uh, and, uh, and as well. Amazing. Well, thank you. Great, we have one more question from Vlad. Uh, I don't want to meet you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. I have a question uh, whether um, your AI music is produced um, with scores, like with MIDI scores, and then transformed to the, uh, to the uh, music or um, uh, with um, the audio samples. Uh, I'm asking because I'm like, uh, 
um, looking or researching in uh, this um, AI produced music, uh, so like um, uh, Melonet or um, Magenta, and recently Jukebox by, uh, by OpenAI. And um, of course, Jukebox um, has um, very well, um, very interesting quality, but it has it's it's pretty long. So to 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 generate a music, it uh, you need um, uh, to spend some yeah. probably eight hours or something like this. And um, what's about your um, um, system? Yeah, yeah I think uh, that um, that's a very good uh, question. So yeah, the jukebox. I think the technology will improve over time and. Uh, uh, definitely reduce the time but at the moment as you say it, it's not practical at all um, uh, and uh, as a system I think well apart from just the practicality of the amount of time that it um, takes I think the flexibility in the type of compositions as well that you create is, is again limited when you work just with audio um, audio files and yeah. uh, files on the other hand um, and music notation is um, much more flexible um, so you can uh, uh, much easier solve um, sort of uh, um, uh, or build algorithms that can accurately predict which ne next uh, a new note progression should happen. The downside of working with media, however, is you have to convert it to audio, uh, and that uh, the technology again to do that in a very sophisticated and sort of real time manner uh, and an easy way um, is is not that uh, well uh, well developed. So. I think you know, part of what we uh, do in some of this uh, sort of secret sources uh, in what we built uh, as a company is solving some of those problems. So we use a combination um, um, uh, of both uh, both uh, approaches rather than just going with the uh, MIDI type of approach and just going with an uh, audio based uh, approach. But it is, it's definitely it's one of the challenges uh, and, um, in this space. You know, how do you convert and create um, really great quality um, audio uh, and very, very quickly? There's, there's quite a few applications where you can. You know, uh, use sort of sound fonts and those type of things where you can in real time or will very quickly convert it, but the quality of the audio that you create uh, is, is not fantastic. So I think it's one of those areas where probably AI needs to develop quite a bit um, in that um, synthesis of uh, um, 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 uh, audio files. And I think that's a big, big opportunity for anybody that wants to develop applications in the, in the music area. Thank you. Great. Um... Uh, thank you. So I guess uh, okay, we're a little bit uh, over time, uh, but we're still all right. So next time to go, and last but not least, Fabio. So Fabio, the stage is yours. I'm going to mute myself. Feel free to share your screen. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. So my name is Fabio, and uh, it's so nice to be here with you. And uh, yes, so my practice space between like photography and AI, my background is in photography, fashion photography. I did the three years at the London College of Fashion and I did a few campaigns. Uh, and uh, you know, during lockdown, um, for me it was a bit difficult to start to shoot outside. And I had my last um, unit project to deliver. So. I was already interested in computer vision, but somehow, like naturally, I started to find out more about AI. An interest that start, if I should be honest, the first time I I saw Pierre Huget, I, I was at the Serpentine, I think, in 2019, and was like amazing. For me, it was like real game changing. Also, recently, I don't do that much photography anymore. I started to do a lot of more AI. I rolled to a MSc in uh, AI Data Science uh, UAL from the new Institute, the Creative Computer Institute. Uh, I did recently a project for days uh, and uh, gap called New Generation Gap. I'm working with a gallery in Italy called uh, Umanesimo Artificiale. And uh, we are doing some project together. And I'm currently in residency at the Immersion Archive. Thank you, Kadeem. Uh, where we are kind of doing something similar to what Eva said before. So we are using our past test of Kadin and the interview, etc., to create in a interactive chat box, which can share her prior knowledge or even talk or give advice to emerging artists. So, yes, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you a bit of my 
the stuff I did, I'm doing. I'm a bit nervous, so I hope you will not mind about it. Uh, so, yes. So, basically, this is one of the pictures I did for the New Generation Gap project. And, uh, yes, so this was my photography before. I wanted to include some picture because at the end of the day, I did photography for a lot of, like, portion of my life. And uh, for me, it's not something different. But for me, photography always lacked or something. And uh, I didn't really know what was lacking. For example, this image uh, was exposed to a big gallery by J.W. Anderson. So things were kind of going good, but something was missing. And uh, also, I always have like this kind of research for investigating the medium, etc. And it's really, really interesting because at some point, I know Lucy Sauter. I don't know if any of you is familiar with her. She was one of my favorite like scholar like ever. And she was having a, a talk in Oxford Circus because she's teaching at uh, the Westminster University. And uh, I met her and I was like, why photography is so flat? If already in the 80s was like, you know, the, this stage from his label was not a flat surface, was something like living in a multidimensional space. And she made me realize about how technology can like defeat this, uh, you know, dogma photography. So I was really, really curious and I started investigating it more before, you know, with traditional media and then with AI. I start, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I start doing like gun from scratch, like copying a bit of code there and there, but then it was difficult and the images were really, really small. So I start to train my, my model on uh, runway ML, however, just to use their pickle file, because uh, when I get the file, pickle is a bit like WinRAR, kind of, Stelios, don't kill me, it's kind of, not the same. So yes, I am uh, exported the pickle file and then uh, I'm using Google Collab, that by the way is amazing, I really, really recommend this to you all. Google Collab allow you to run like uh, um, sorry run algorithm in a digital machine without the need of having like a really super fancy computer. And yes, with this pickle model, a bit of Collab code, a bit of my code, I start to do my cats, my lovely, my baby. And yes, this is an example from the website. This person does not exist. I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar, but I felt like including it. And yes, this is Telgan 2. These are some of the projects uh, I did with Days. Uh, for Days, I hoped I had more material, but yes. And yes, also, as I was explaining before, Photo sculpture is something I did not invent it, of course, and was something I always seen and always be like really, really fascinating of research like new way with new technology of shifting the bi-dimensional space in a multi-dimensional realm. And doing my research, you know, looking already on 1860, uh, sorry, 1860, what like people were really researching was this. It's just, you know, changing a bit the, the, uh, the dialogue. And especially on the 1917 photography into sculpture, that was the exhibition I was talking before, or was really, really curious because you can see that a lot of photographer like were interested by understand the, uh, how you can expand like visual art in a multidimensional realm. And this, for example, is one of the last software I use, uh, software, sorry, algorithm, and this called PIFUHD. And basically from a single image, to create a three-dimensional mesh. And uh, yes, I'm also exploring more software now, however, when you start to do like this kind of stuff, a lot of maths, you know, start to appear. And uh, after at some point, you cannot really escape from it. And is the reason why I'm doing an MSc in the subject. 
because you know when you're trying maybe to play with some of these uh, algorithm it's okay i mean i still doing that without a lot of prior knowledge but maybe when you really want to start to personalize them etc then uh, you know i really really find helpful to have like a background where i can study and i can change the thing as much as i want without always set to us for a next trend or something like that and yes uh, i hope um, you have some question uh, and i hope i was clear about my practice for me it's really important that uh, it's clear the thing that uh, I still do photography in my own way, but it's photography with different tools, but with the same purpose I was uh, having before. And yes, and if you have any question. Great, thank you, Fabio. Uh, any questions from our audience? I have a question. Uh -huh. I can replay uh, publicly, even if it was private. Uh, I've been asked, uh, did you also work with computer vision? And uh, if you mean YOLO, I did something like uh, for recognizing images. Yes, I did something over I use in OpenCV, et cetera, but I'm still exploring that possibility, especially because right now I'm really, really, really interested in melting like a 3D space with a bidimensional space. And maybe if I work really hard, maybe something new or something that has not been done before, because for me, uh, photography in a three-dimensional realm has always been really, really important. And I think the reason is why my tutor always told me it was not possible during my BA. And uh, I always took that really, really personally. So yes, uh, I always you know was kind of the black sheep in my class. Uh, have you explored 3D Ken Burns effect or 3D photo in painting? Not really, because funny enough, uh, Everything I do is with AI, and uh, often this is a bit of the problem. If someone have not find it out yet, I mean, I cannot kind of do it. However, you know, I really, really interested in um, understand how software like, I don't know, like Maya or ZBrush or Photoshop work to a deeper level, because uh, what I'm understanding is that from this like, really really complicated software there are always things you can borrow from and uh, add uh, you know extra value to to the table for example before this course i was doing a chat box with uh, sorry chat bot i don't know why i keep calling them chat box they are not boxes and uh, yes before the beginning of this course i was using i ibm watson but now I'm approaching, before I was thinking to actually do something with GPT-2 because the free is not available yet for me. I mean, for me, maybe you are more lucky than me. And, uh, but then maybe I was saying that it's, you know, it's more challenging, even if it might a bit to, a little bit worse to do it with an RNA. It's more challenging for me. It's going to be more fun. So, you know, I really, really start to enjoy this process. And it's funny because one year ago, I did not have any idea of what AI was. It was like flabbergasted when I saw it a certain time. And now after one year, I feel like I'm here speaking about you, about what I'm doing. So really, really proud of how this dialogue is born in, you know, and I really, really happy with it. And I hope it was clear was one of my first talk. I really, really, you know, excited so i hope everything was clear and yes perfect uh and uh we have one more question from vlad um let me unmute you vlad are you still on mute yeah try to press the microphone 
Yeah, thank you. Um, this question was uh, was already answered um, regarding 3D can burns effect or 3D photo painting um, because it's like exploring of uh, 2D uh, imagery uh, with 3D approach. Mm -hmm. So it, it yes. was already. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> yes, I never done, but I will check out these names because if I should be honest with you, I'm not really familiar with them. But uh, I will have a look at them and actually thanks because maybe they will be helpful, you know, for not only my practice, but for all our practice, you know, because we are on this together, you know. Yes, um, because I can um, share some tutorials with um, about this approach um, because interestingly, um, AI um, explores the speciality of um, the two, um, 2D imagery in its own ways. So it's like uh, something um, um, something not only data science re um, related, but, but also very, very artistical, so beyond the reality. It's pretty um, interesting to experiment with it. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. And yes, it's a really, really interesting thing. You know, and uh, also I really, really happy that we are all having this kind of dialogue because uh, I never thought, you know, there, there was so much interest in this kind of topic. I always thought like STEM subject and our subject never really were able to work together. But now I feel like there is really something real, you know, and um, I'm actually fascinated by this. I never thought uh, I would have seen something like this um, in my lifetime, you know, especially because uh, I'm uh, picturing my mind a future where artists and scientists work together, maybe to cure illness, maybe to cure, I don't know, cancer or something like that it will be something really, really nice to see, uh, at least from my point of view. And then the reason why I, you know, I start to use all this te technology, etc., because I was somehow looking to contribute to not of course a better future would be cocky from my side to say so but for kind of you know to build a dialogue and to help each other even if different fields you know are really really happy with it great great thank you so first thank, thanks everyone uh, for your wonderful presentations and i'd like to also thank our participants for the questions for the, and the interesting dialogue we had. And now we'll move on to our last session. Uh, we're a bit over time, uh, but I guess uh, there are like 34 people still here. So that's, that's great. It means that what we're talking about is very interesting. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to pose a question to our panelists and then anyone who has anything to talk about or any questions which were not answered, feel free to pop them into the, the chat room and hopefully we can have a bit of a free flowing conversation. But first, I'd like to ask each one of our panelists in turn about what they believe is the future of the space of AI in art and uh, where do they see themselves in the next uh, few years in this space? So, Gautier, maybe you'd like to go first. All right. Uh, sure. So, yeah, it's, uh, as I, I mentioned uh, at the end of, uh, of my talk, so there are, I think there are like two pathways. Uh, and the one we fight for is for AI to become a proper movement. Uh, kind of same as uh, photography uh, with uh, artists using that technology uh, and galleries special specializing in uh, this type of art. Um, and so I think it's uh, kind of going that way and uh, that's uh, a really good thing uh, for everyone working uh, in this field. And uh, the other way would be to, to have it like more like a uh, like a tool uh, integrated to other tools uh, and that it, it kind of melts with uh, uh, like digital art and like all kind of technological arts. Um, so yeah, I think those two futures and I hope uh, it's going to be the first one. Yeah, so it's probably uh, going to be a mix in the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe like some people will use the title AI artist uh, in the, the next few years, right? And oh, we're uh, we're already doing it, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. And hopefully, you know, the public will also understand what this is. Great, yeah, hopefully, Great. That, that's, that's quite optimistic. Hopefully, this is going to be the case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice, uh, Eva. Uh, what's your perspective? Um. Uh... <laughs> I don't know. I'm not um, 
fortune teller, but I guess, I guess uh, the kind of the image that you presented, Pierre, the the two by two, you know, it's it's involving the AI and the human, and I I think what I see is that the conversations I'm part of and and the kind of fascinations that artists that I'm working with are um, pursuing have a lot to do with sort of decentering human intelligence or adopting other kinds of intelligence into that conversation. So I would say maybe that's sort of like that two by two is going to like open up into three, four or five D space. Thanks, and Pierre. I mean, I guess this leads uh, direct straight into you. <laughs> yeah, I think, um... Yeah, for me, it's sort of, if you look back historically um, in, the, in the music industry, there's always been sort of new technology that come um, uh, and then completely changes the way uh, the music industry works uh, and really revolutionizes it. And I think AI is this next wave of uh, uh, innovation. I, I think we're really only at the starting uh, point of it. I think there's very few um, uh, musicians and artists that really uh, use AI as part of the um, uh, creation process. And I think that in the next decade, I think it's going to change. I think. We definitely, um, in the short term, uh, I think AI is going to become much more of an assistive uh, role um, and in combination with a, a music creator, um, I think a lot of compositions are um, going to be created in the, in the coming decade. I think if you look a little bit further ahead, uh, though, I think um, at least my take on this, I think when AI becomes more and more sophisticated in, in creating music, because at the moment it's still a, it's a very difficult problem to solve and uh, the type of music that it's created is often not fantastic quality, but I think um, as it improves and improves, um, I think in a few decades time, you'll end up with sort of new, completely new music styles being uh, being created, something that humans just by themselves wouldn't have come up with. Uh, and I think that's gonna be probably a longer term vision. We'll end up with more interesting uh, and new types and, and styles of, of music as a result of uh, um, AI. Can I ask you something about, about music? Um, so I, I was looking into, uh, Schoenberg's uh, 12 tone technique actually we, we call like some like learning about this many years ago and uh, you know in music some there, there are always some let's say small groups of people who are um, really who, who like experimentation sometimes even for the sake of experimentation and uh, maybe Schoenberg was one of them and we've seen the same electronic music um, do you see uh, AI generated music do you see some people using AI to do this sort of thing um, or do you think you might see more AI being used for, let's say, more like commercial or mainstream music and simply an additional uh, tool? Like, so basically, can you imagine a new wave of, uh, let's say, musicians running like pretty, let's say, surreal performances, experimental yeah. performances using AI generated music? I guess this would be very interesting if you did live yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think, I think my take would be on, on both. Um, I think it will definitely help sort of popular music and also I think uh, sort of very pushing the boundaries uh, in terms of the type of music. Uh, and that gets created. I think sort of pop music, if you listen to it, it's much simpler, the structure, it's much easier for an AI to be trained on how to create pop music. Whereas if you have really, um, um, as you mentioned, sort of uh, new uh, uh, music and music ideas, I think that's much more difficult uh, um, uh, to train an AI system uh, um, to do, but they are people that use this really interesting algorithms and really interesting ideas uh, to also create some very, very novel uh, and, and music. So I, th I think you know, it's got an application for both for mainstream and mm -hmm. for uh, and really pushing the boundaries of the type of styles and music that gets created. Nice, nice. Great. And uh, Fabio, so what do, what do you think uh, about the future of this space? Uh, I think you're on mute. Let me ask you on mute. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Yeah, sure. I think uh, I already said before that for me, a bit the future of this kind of discipline between like AI and arts, I mean, uh, arts practice in AI, it's this kind of dialogue that now is happening because I'm aware that of course, dialogue uh, between like science and art already happened in the past, but I really, really think that now there is such a disruptive potential for really, really build something solid and something new has never quite happened in the past. Maybe I'm wrong, but I really, really hope for this. You know, maybe I'm a bit, you know, too optimistic on this side, but 
I really, really hope for it because, for example, I see always more calls that not require all these, you know, previous skills, etc. So yes, I really, really think we are going forward this direction. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess everyone can agree that things are moving uh, pretty fast on all levels, right? I think some of you have been focused more on the technical aspects, others focused more on the social aspects. And I think this is being made on all fronts. Uh, and uh, before we close, I'd like to you know, ask the participants if they have any questions which they'd like to, uh, to ask, uh, which they didn't have the exact opportunity to, to ask earlier, or um, if there's anything not necessarily related to the talks, but to the topic of AI and creativity and art, which we didn't cover, and um, you know, they'd, they'd like to talk about it. I think there was a question about... Uh, uh, yeah, about uh, legal, um, uh, like the legal side of uh, AI generating oh, yeah. art. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so so we've worked uh, quite a bit on that because uh, uh, because of the first sale, we've worked with uh, lawyers to kind of uh, solve that question. So maybe I can uh, I can help. Um, and so uh, I think the idea is that the the law isn't really up to date uh, with uh, uh, like artworks created with AI. Uh, but still, um, uh, what tends to be the like the general uh, uh, like uh, the general feeling is that uh, anything created uh, with AI and with uh, generate generative uh, algorithms uh, is the pro uh, property of the of the actually the guy who uh, trained the algorithms on that subject. So uh, you you don't seem to to need like any rights to the uh, to like the, the the original sources uh, if your process is transformative enough. Um, so uh, in our work, we tend to to be careful about that and to either work with in institutions or uh, work on uh, free of right images. And uh, uh, maybe you, you guys do the same. Uh, but I think for now, uh, the law is quite uh, open about that. And uh, so the, the law is not up to date and it's generative. So it's kind of... Uh, uh, a free land for experimentation. But, uh, can I say something? Just one second. In my opinion, it's the same as, uh, at least in my point of view, it's like when you use Photoshop, for example. I mean, you edit it with a program, but the final image is yours. I mean, you don't credit like Adobe every time you do a photo retouch. M maybe I'm naive in this point of view, but always see like this. I mean, yes, we are not even using software most of the time. We are using like pure code. And at this point, you know, all the editing program are code at the end of the day, if, if you understand where I'm coming from, from a legal point of view, of course. Perfect. Uh, yeah, someone was asking me about whether this session will be available. Yes, um, uh, this is being recorded. Uh, by Zoom, and it's going to be made available on my website, the datascientist.com. Uh, anyone else? Interesting point about uh, Tracy has, uh, has a question. Yeah, I was just um, picking up on that last point. It's something that intrigues me, really, because we've, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, who owns uh, what an AI does. But um, just a few weeks ago, I think the uh, EU legislative process said that an AI cannot be a creator, and I just wonder what what you know where that might go from the from a creative's point of view. I mean, sure, sure, there's um, sure things are your copyright um, when things are transformative enough, but what does transformative enough mean in this context when you're using somebody else's algorithm? and the training data set is also third party generated. What, what, of, what is it that you have created in the process? And how do, you, how do you think you attribute IP to each of those stakeholders, I think? We don't have these, I don't think we have these models in, in legal process, not that I can figure out, but I wonder what, what the panel's view is of that. How do we attribute IP? when it's distributed ownership, I guess. 
Thank you. Yeah, who'd like to answer? I, I think everyone still answer. I think it's a difficult question. Uh, <laughs> but I think I can maybe go back to um, sort of maybe again uh, uh, the music um, side of things. And um, so, for example, you how do you attribute back to specific artists that's helped uh, um, a train an algorithm? Uh, I think it's incredibly um, difficult and um, difficult to do. But there are certain ways in which you can almost if you after you've built an algorithm, uh, you can go back and identify each of the data points to what extent did that play a role in your algorithm. So that's, for example, one way, uh, if you set it up that, um, say, I trained it on 10 uh, very famous artists, I can say, okay, well, each of the artists in specific um, um, model that I've created, to what extent that they influence uh, the, the algorithm. So, so that's one, one example. Uh, of a potential approach. But I think the reason also why nobody's answered it, I don't think there is any standard and, and clear answer at the moment. I think as Gautier said earlier, I think the, the legal frameworks itself is, um, is not developed enough. Uh, I don't think there's a clear, uh, clear correct answer, but I think there will be quite a few uh, lawsuits um, um, in time to come uh, and to try and uh, get clarity of exactly this type of uh, um, situation. Great, yeah, and Fabio says blockchain potentially. Uh, I guess that that's uh, another area which I'm personally very interested in, and maybe in the next meetup, it's worth even having a speaker uh, on that topic. I think the whole space of using blockchain um, for IP, uh, artwork, and the provenance, and, and you know, and all that stuff, it's it's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we had seen some early examples of this around crypto kitties and. Uh, but now there are also some spaces where you can just upload your art in the blockchain and you can sell it there. And we'll, we'll see whether, I think this is growing, but probably it's gonna break into the mainstream as well. Uh, who knows, maybe um, around the same time that AI and art uh, becomes more widespread. How would an artist, uh, Valeria, you have an interesting question. All right, so uh, hello everybody. The question is, uh, because someone said that maybe if you trained your model in 10 different banks, then you would have to pay some fees to them if I did understand correctly. So my question is, that, you know, most banks have uh, attributed their styles to several prior older bands that, or artists that they've heard, and then they've actually gotten that's their own style, but it has hints of some other artists, maybe Bob Dylan and something similar so how is that different from training an ai model to five or six different artists in one case we say okay i have influences but this is all my own my own creations in the other end we have an ai that creates new mu music based on all uh, styles of other bands and then we say okay but it has been trained on that specific data set so it has to pay some fees or share the earnings with them that's my question yeah yeah i think uh, again it, it's quite quite difficult I can, I can just talk about sort of the, the music cases where there's been a few um legal cases where um somebody would create a, a song and then uh, there's a legal case where it's too similar to a song that was created 50 years ago where there's, there's also other songs that definitely have been influenced by a number of artists there uh, that's significantly different enough it's got similar you can see there's traces of the original but it's different enough that it gets seen as a as a unique uh, um uh, work and I think it's probably going to be something similar on the, in the AI space. If it's if it's really very reminiscent and very similar to uh, one of the artists who worked, uh, it would uh, and, uh, come across as being uh, and uh, um, uh, just copied. Whereas if it deviates enough and significantly uh, uh, different enough, uh, uh, potentially that's then seen as a it's it's different enough. It's a it's a new work or uh, work of art. Again, uh, the, the the tricky bit and the, the bit that, that is unclear is exactly where do you draw that line and at what stage does it become uh, um, uh, new enough um, uh, and novel enough that it's not just purely a, a copy. Yeah, I mean, um, if I want to I'd like also to comment on this, and I guess uh, depending on someone's philosophical stance on AI, someone might say not much. 
you know, because uh, our brain uses neurons and absorbs information and extracts patterns, and the neural network uses artificial neurons and does the same. Uh, so I guess this, uh, you know, you, you can we can have very long philosophical discussions about this because this is also very closely linked to the problem of um, when does an AI really understand something? Yeah, um, when does it really understand language? With, with GPT-3 and every iteration that it gets better and better, uh, there's always like articles saying, oh, you know, GPT-3 and this model, they're so amazing. Does this mean that AI, uh, you know, has reached Terminator level or really understands language the same way we do? And, uh, you know, the, most people would say no, but then again, the, the results are so impressive that, uh, it's, you know, it's not an easy no, you know? <laughs> you understand what I mean. Um, but yeah. Cool. So uh, I guess uh, we're like uh, uh, about nearly like two hours uh, on this meetup, and uh, un unless there are any uh, other, any more questions, uh, I guess we'll uh, we call it a day. Um, yeah. So I think there are no more questions. So thanks everyone for participating, and uh, I'm also pretty glad that most of the people stayed uh, uh, till the, the end. Uh, we had like 40 people at, at one point, so it looks like this format for the meetup is, is a success. Maybe even after the lockdown, we'll go for a blended format, maybe have uh, an online presentation so we can have people from all over the world and then offline mingling in, in London. Uh, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's, that's the way to do it. I mean, many, many companies, many organizations, universities are exploring these hybrid models for interaction. So. Why not? Uh, so yeah, once again, I'd like to thank you. And uh, don't forget, if anyone is interested to know more about the, um, to, to work on this uh, Google Doc with the tools, uh, uh, this is the link. Uh, and uh, the meetup is being uploaded on Zoom and will be available on the Data Scientist My Blog after, uh, after this is uh, uploaded on Zoom. So thanks everyone again, and I uh, hope to see Thank you, you so again much for another meetup for some place else. Yeah, thanks Eva. Thank you very much for organizing it's it. Nice it. meeting Thank everyone. Thank you, Celio. Thanks nice everyone. Nice to meet you all. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.